amazing. I hope that's a precursor to how awesome this worship service is going to be this morning. Good morning, Florence Christian Church. All of those who are worshiping online with us this morning, thank you for being here this morning. Look, I made a mistake. I did not wear my track shoes this morning because there's going to be some songs that need a lot of energy. And you might need to be running around out there. I don't know. Today we're going to talk about calling the storm. And the one way that we know that we can do that is through Jehovah Jireh. Who's that? That's a name for God that says God will provide. And so this morning we know that all of those storms that we go through in life, they can be calmed by being present with this amazing, ever-loving God that we serve this morning. We are so thankful that you're here. We're ready to get a little gospel this morning of this first song because we know that we are loved by this amazing God. And doing so, being here in worship, makes us glad and excited to be here and part of God's ministry in this world. So join us as we sing. Here we go.
Amen. I hope that you're feeling glad and energetic because this next song we're going to sing <laughs> continues with that theme that God is so much greater, that the God that lives inside of us, those of us that follow Christ and his teachings is so much greater than what's happening in the world. That whatever issues we are going through currently, God never leaves us. That God was, is within us to help us overcome those things. Knowing that gives us strength. Knowing that being a part of a community of faith also gives us that strength and encouragement that we need to know that no matter what it is that's happening, God will provide. God does provide. Bring your tithe, bring your shame, bring your guilt, and bring your pain. Don't you know it's not your name? You will always be much more to me. Every day I wrestle with the voices that keep telling me I'm not right. That's all. May that ever be so. May you know that God calls you as his redeemed, no matter what's happened in the past, no matter what may be coming in the future, that God always lives within your heart and stays with you, is always available whenever you need it, which then makes this next part that we sing about 
being made to worship a thing that you can't help wanting to be a part of. It's our time to give back to God to say, thank you, God, for loving me when I couldn't love myself. That makes worship so much sweeter. If you're going through this currently in your life and you're here, we couldn't celebrate more with you for being in this place right now. Sing with us. Before the day, before the light, before the world revolved around the sun, yeah, I got on high, stepped down into time. I wrote the story of his love for everyone. He has filled our hearts with wonder so that we always remember you and I made to worship, you and I are called to love, you and I are forgiven. Join me in prayer. Oh, gracious and loving God, you have called us to this place because we are your people. You breathed into each of us the beautiful, unique breath of life, and you made us to worship you because all that we have and all that we are flows from your love for this universe, for creation, and for all of us. And so be with us now as we lift up our hearts and our souls and our spirits to you. Help us to know and experience your love so that we may go and see who you have called us to be. 
people who love you and who serve you to make this world a more whole, a more holy, a more healed, a more peaceful place. All these things we pray in the name of your son, Jesus the Christ, who shows us the way to be. And all God's people say, amen, amen. I invite you to take your seats, and is anybody, any of my, any of my friends would like to come forward and help me with the children's blessing are invited to do so. You got a buddy coming. So uh, during this summer break, we are continuing to invite you all. We are blessed by your presence here in the sanctuary. And there is um, on this back bookshelf right back there, there are some things that uh, may help you during worship because sometimes adults talk a lot, right? Yeah. Okay. So you guys ready? Okay. How do we start this? We make our L's, right? And we use either hand and we put it up to the shoulder across. And we say this all together. The Lord be with you as you worship and also with you as you worship. Thank you guys so much. You are such wonderful worship leaders. Let's give them a round of applause today. Scripture is from Matthew 3, 13 to 4, 11. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you and you do come to me. But Jesus answered him, let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God ascending like a dove and alighting of him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted forty days and forty nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands... They will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, again, it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan. For it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him, and suddenly angels came and waited on him. May God add a blessing and reading to them his word. Before I begin with the sermon today, I do want us to take a moment to remember our friends and neighbors in eastern Kentucky who are going through a very, very difficult time right now. And remember that we are called uh, to be neighbor. And one of the ways that we can be neighbors at Florence Christian Church is to contribute to our Week of Compassion offering. Week of Compassion is the disaster relief arm of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. And 100% of the money that is given for this cause goes directly to that point of need. And so today, as you're considering your own gifts online or in person, please consider giving a donation to the Week of Compassion. You can just put that, if you're making a checkout, you can just put that in the note. If you're making a contribution online, just kind of make a note of that as well. Um, thank you, and let's continue to pray for our brothers and sisters who are suffering. 
This morning, we are going to begin a new sermon series on, on one of the things that I love, and that is the life and the ministry of Jesus that calls us to our own life, our ministry in Jesus. I'm very excited to share these weeks with you as we are encouraged to walk in the footsteps of Jesus. Now, I remember, you know, when I think about walking in the footsteps of Jesus, I remember my very first pilgrimage to the Holy Land in 1991. I've had the privilege of attend being there three times in the 90s, and um, each time was so meaningful to me. But the first time I went, the first time I walked where Jesus walked, it j gave me a whole new perspective um, about the life that Jesus lived, about the calling that Jesus gives, about what it means, what it meant for him, and what it means for the world to follow him. Um, so, you know, I hope that during these weeks you will have an opportunity to experience that anew in your own life. And also for those who might be interested in joining me, I'm going to do one more pilgrimage to the Holy Land in May of 2023. And I'd love to have many of you come with me um, and have that kind of spiritual renewal that takes place as we journey together uh, and walk where Jesus walked. Regardless of whether you stay here or you go, my prayer for us is as we experience this time together um, in the next seven weeks, we will be encouraged to rededicate our lives and to help us to walk more closely in the footsteps, in the footsteps of Jesus. Will you pray with me? Loving and gracious God, as we open our hearts to you today and as we consider where your steps lead us, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts might be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. For you, O oh God, are our strength and our redeemer. And through Jesus the Christ, you show us the way to walk and to live in him. We pray these things in his name. Amen. Today, we are going to talk about the highs and the lows of calling as we journey with Jesus through two very important events that shaped his life and ministry, namely his baptism and his temptation in the wilderness. And to do that, I want to begin by sharing a map with you about where these events took place. What we're looking at right now is called the Judean Wilderness. And at the top of the map, you will see the Jordan River running down. Now, the jo Jordan River um, connects two bodies of water. The northern part of it is the Sea of Galilee. That's north of your map that you're seeing today. But that is the area where Jesus grew up, and he spent most of his ministry um, just walking around the, the Sea of Galilee and teaching. If you go with me to the Holy Land, you'll just get a grasp of how cool that is, and you can see how it happened. But the Sea of Galilee feeds the Jordan River, and the Jordan River goes down, and it empties out into what's called the Dead Sea. Now, it's called the Dead Sea because, well, it's dead. <laughs> Just duh. Uh, it's dead. It, nothing lives in it. There's no fish or any kind of living being other than minerals and lots and lots of salt. Um, so if you actually go there next May with me, um, one of the things that's really cool about the Sea of Galilee is you float. I mean, you can let, literally sit on top of the water. No, you don't have to paddle. You have to do anything. It just, you got so much salt content, so many, so much mineral um, in there that it just brings you right up to the top. But I do want to give you a heads up. Be sure when you're floating around that you don't get that water in your eyes because I can promise you from personal experience, you will not be a happy camper. It is very painful and you don't want to do that. So just say it. Okay, back to our map. <laughs> now, there are two places that everybody's very familiar with. What Can, can you name them? Two, two places, Jerusalem and Bethlehem. Okay, so we're all familiar with those places because they're part of our Christian tradition. Um, but one area that may be unfamiliar to you is seated between those two, and that is a place called Qumran. Now, Qumran is out in the middle of the desert, and it got major attention. It, we didn't know much about Qumran until 1946. 1946, when three sheep herders 
were up, you know, with their sheep in the cave area, and they found these, um, these pots, these clay pots. And um, what was in them caused quite a uproar because in those clay pots was what became known as the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls, the contents were the greatest discovery in the Judeo-Christian world since the time of Christ because it gives us, there wasn't any manuscripts, full manuscripts that were existing. So it gives us the oldest, the oldest surviving manuscripts that we have verifying the religious life of ancient Jerusalem and Judaism up to the first century CE, which tells us a little bit about the culture in which Jesus and the Christian movement started. So after that discovery in 1946, just think about it, that wasn't that long ago in history, a huge interest in this area led many to many archaeological digs in Qumran, that area right there, which in 1951 revealed a settlement that they've been able to date sometime around 134 BCE, before the Common Era, and surviving until around 70 CE, when Rome destroyed almost everything in that region, including Jerusalem. A Jewish mystical sect called the Essenes were one of the groups that scholars believe have settled there. And it was in the caves surrounding this community that the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered. And so their theory is that they were writing these manuscripts. They were copying them. They were preserving them. So why does that matter for us this morning? Well, many scholars believe that John the Baptist was actually a member of the Essene community, which influenced his ministry as a prophet and his title as the baptizer. So let's take a moment to talk about baptism for John and for the Jews, because yes, the Jews practice a form of baptism. Don't know if you knew that. It is called a mikvah or a ritual bath. And the purpose of the mikvah was for cleansing of various impurities. The picture you see on the screen is of a mikvah in the excavated Essene settlement. They actually had seven of those on that settlement. And here we find two sets of steps in the ritual bath, one for going into the water and the other one for exiting out of the water. Now, think about this. John's baptism was built on this which takes us to the Jordan River. John left Qumran and the Essene community, and he came to the Jordan River to offer cleansing, not just for the members of that one mystical separated community of Jewish faith, but for everyone, everyone. In John's ministry, everyone had the opportunity to be cleansed from their impurities in the Jordan River. And as scripture tells us, people flocked there from all the surrounding communities, including Jerusalem, which was only about 15 miles away. And as we read in the Gospels, people came from all kinds of backgrounds. We even hear of Roman soldiers being there and being baptized. So they came to hear John's message. They came to be baptized. And while 15 miles on the, um, by foot is a distance to be traveled by anybody, I want you to think about this. Jesus came from Galilee, which was a seven to nine day walk in order to be baptized by John. Now, what did, what did John's baptism mean? There were three primary things that we find in John's baptism. First, as we've already talked about, baptism was for purification. It was a ritual cleansing that took place as often as needed. And many people did it very often, several times a day. Um, but John added another element to his baptismal message. He called for the people to repent. Now, to repent means to turn around, to turn around from sin and then turn one's direction to God. To repent involves a change of heart and mind that leads to a change in how one lives. 
Finally, John's baptism would also have included a Jewish practice used for initiation into the Jewish community for those who were not born into it. One more thing. As I mentioned earlier, the Jordan River flows down into the Dead Sea where literally nothing lives. So I want you to think about this, that as the people came to be cleansed in the Jordan, as they received God's forgiveness and they repented, um, their sins and impurities flowed where? It flowed down into the Dead Sea where nothing lives. What a wonderful image of baptism. Just as one entered the mikvah on one set of steps and went up the other, so in the Jordan River, sins and impurities flowed out into the Dead Sea, never to return again. Now, as we know, Jesus did not need to be forgiven, right? Uh, he had no need to be cleansed. The scriptures tell us that Jesus was without sin. In fact, John actually protests when Jesus comes to the river. He says, I, I, don't need to be I don't need to be baptizing you. You need to baptize me. And what does Jesus say? He says, no, let us do this to fulfill all righteousness. And in so doing, Jesus shows us the model for what a life that is in obedience to God looks like. So let's think about Jesus' baptism and what happens. Because in his baptism, we learn something more about what happens to us in Christian baptism. First, let's remember the words that we find in all of the Gospels. But I want to read from Mark chapter 1. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son, my beloved. In you, I am well pleased. Now talk about a high and holy moment. Jesus came to the Jordan in obedience to fulfill all righteousness. And when he did that... God did something amazing, too. As Jesus is coming out of the water, he sees the heavens open. He sees the heavens torn apart, Mark's gospel says, and the Spirit comes upon him. And then Jesus hears God's voice saying, you are my son, my beloved. I am so pleased with you. You are my child, my beloved. I am so pleased with you. This is what happens to us in Christian baptism. God claims you and me as God's beloved child. We receive the Holy Spirit. And from there, you and I are called to ministry. You and I are called to service in Christ's name. Yes, baptism. It is a high and holy moment in all of our lives as Christians. It is one of the ways that we follow Jesus in obedience, and we recognize that we have been called God's beloved for service. And I want to say that if you've never been baptized, I want to ask you to please consider it. Uh, talk with me or Pastor Diana about how baptism is important to your faith journey and what a difference it makes in your life. For those who have, have been baptized, today I want to invite you to remember this high and holy moment of calling in your life. And later in the service today, as we are um, having communion together and making our way, we're going to have some places, some baptismal remembrance stations where you can dip your hands into the water. Maybe you might anoint yourself on your forehead or on your hand with the sign of the cross and remember your baptism. Remember that you are God's beloved child, that you are holy and blessed by God, that you are beloved by God, and that you are called by God for service. Now, just after Jesus was baptized, we are told that he is driven by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. On the screen is a picture of the Mount of Tem Temptation, the traditional site where Jesus spent 40 days after his baptism. And during those 40 days, while he prayed and fasted in one of those caves that you might see there, 
Um, this was a time of Jesus's preparation for his ministry. He had nothing to eat. He had nothing to eat for 40 days. Consider that. Now, this fasting for 40 days is linked to the great Old Testament prophets, Moses and Elijah, who both I fasted for 40 days as well on a, on a mountain um, in preparation for their calling in life. And so Jesus obeyed the Spirit in going through this time of preparation as well. Before he began his public ministry, he goes to the wilderness where he is tempted by the devil. Now, in Luke's gospel, we hear about the temptations that happen during this period in the wilderness. And it begs the question, at least for me, why is this a part of the story? I mean, why didn't Jesus just immediately go on from that high moment of baptism into his ministry? I mean, when I have one of those high holy moments in my life, I mean, I am ready to go. I am ready to, the world is the oyster. I'm ready to experience it in all its fullness. And yet Jesus withdraws. He goes into the wilderness. Why? Why is temptation necessary as a part of the story of Jesus' calling. Well, first, and I believe foremost, is because through though Jesus was God made flesh, he was also fully human. Jesus didn't just appear to be human, he was human. And being fully human means that temptation will come. While God made us in the image of God, God does not control us like a puppet master. No, you and I have free will. And because we have free will, temptation reminds us that we have a choice to live into God's intention for our lives or not. We get to choose obedience or to choose another way that sometimes may look good on the surface, but will ultimately lead to our destruction. So what are the three temptations? It had been 40 days, and Jesus was famished, we were told. So the devil says, if you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. In other words, break your fasting of food. Take care of yourself, Jesus. Speak, and the stone will become bread, just as when God spoke at creation, and it was so. You know, that sounds perfectly fine on the surface. We talk about it all the time. Self-care is important. Jesus, self-care is important. God doesn't want you to starve. Why don't you use the power that you have to do what God did since you are apparently God's son? But what did Jesus say? He said, people shall not live by bread alone. The temptation to break the fast that Jesus had been called to was not up to him. It was, again, about being faithful to God's call, to God's will. And there will be times in all of our lives when we will be tempted to try the shortcut that seems easier, even more reasonable than being faithful. And we get to choose. The second temptation of the devil was to give Jesus this panoramic view. And we can Already imagine he's on that high mountain and perhaps he's looking out and seeing this amazing vast uh, area, miles and miles around him. And, um, and the tempter says, I'm going to give you the authority and the splendor of the world. All the wealth of the earth will be yours if you worship me. How easy it is to be tempted to pursue dollars and power and wealth. And the temptation not to give God what belongs to God. Jesus talked about this many times in his ministry. He said, you cannot serve God and money. And we all know this temptation all too well. This desire for more and more and more and not to put God first in our lives. Finally, Jesus is taken to the pinnacle of the temple and the devil says, if you are the son of God, Throw yourself off this temple and prove yourself to others so that they know you are the Son of God. For it is written that God will send the angels to lift you up and to keep you from all harm. 
And in this temptation is the question of whether Jesus really trusted God. We all have that same temptation. And what does Jesus say? It is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. You see, in every one of these temptations, Jesus uses what? He uses scripture to combat it. And by the way, so does the devil. The devil uses scripture. So how did Jesus know how to discern between God's truth from the devil's lies in the misuse of scripture when he was tempted? Here's the key. You ready? Jesus immersed himself in scripture. He lived with it. He made it a daily practice. He knew God through it so that when he was tempted, he would understand where the lie was and where the truth was, and he could withstand the temptation. Know this. During the lows, the valleys, during the times of temptation, the times when we are at our weakest, when temptation comes to each of us, knowing the scripture means everything. Of course, that wasn't the end of the devil's temptations in Jesus' life. During the highs of success as he taught and healed and delivered people and performed miracles all the way to the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus was tempted. Make no mistake about it. But he refused to give up on God's call for his life. And beloved of God, this, that's my prayer for you and for me today. That in the highs and in the lows of our calling, we will remember our Savior. We will remember his way, the way that led him to baptism through obedience, the way that led him into the wilderness and temptation, the way that led him into ministry and service and sacrifice. Let us remember. Let us follow. And as you and I walk in the footsteps of our Savior, in the highs and the lows of our lives and our calling. Let us remember his words. Let us say it together. Not my will, but your will be done. May it be so. And the people of God said, amen and amen. The highs and lows, Jesus experienced them all. And I remember the last week of his life when he came into Jerusalem and people were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. How high and holy that must have been to him to feel that love, to feel that grace, to feel the power that comes from his ministry and the salvation that will come through his ministry. And then I remember just a few days later when he came to the table and he sat with his disciples and he told them what was coming because he knew that the lowest point in his life was ahead of him. And at that moment when he was at his potentially lowest point, he said, this is my body. This is my blood given for you. Do this to remember me. And so today as we come to the communion table, as we come in up the center aisle and receive the cup and the, and the juice, the bread and the juice, my prayer for us is that we will remember his words, that we will remember what that life calls us to as we go forth from this place, a, a life of service and sacrifice, a life of love and generosity, a life where we are obedient to the call of God. And then as you, after you receive the signs of God's love for us in the bread and the wine, that you will make your way and renew your baptism. Remember your baptism. Give God thanks for God's generous love and grace in your life. Let us prepare our hearts as we sing a song of praise together. Will you stand? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above. Father, 
Son, and Holy Ghost. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, now with us. In praise of God for all things, we come to this table and we remember how Jesus gathered with his friends and he took a loaf of bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to his followers and he said, take, eat, this is my body that is broken for you. Every time you eat this, do this in remembrance of me. And we remember how after supper, he took the cup and after giving thanks, he passed it among them. And he said, take, drink, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for the forgiveness of sin. Every time you drink this, do this in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, you sent your son down for each one of us, not the rich, not the wealthy, not the powerful, but each one of us, those of us that walk the daily lives, these elements today that we take, let them strengthen our bodies, let them strengthen our minds, let, their strength, let them strengthen our souls. Give us the strength to walk this daily life. This bread representing that body that was broken on that cross for us the blood that was spilled to wash us clean. These emblems are here because we want to draw closer to you. Your son showed us the way. We today continue to follow that way. Bless these emblems and bless these people. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. All are welcome to come and receive these gifts, these signs of God's love for you, because beloved, with you, God is well pleased. Let us join together.
I get the opportunity today to talk a little bit about the commitments that we have. You have the opportunity to commit yourself to support church. You have the opportunity to make a difference in the world. We have that opportunity given to us each and every day. One of my favorite things is every day is chock full of opportunity. If you don't learn something new every day, you're going backwards. <laughs> That's the teacher in me. It's always going to be there. My kids grew up with it. When I was coaching, my players all knew it. We have to learn something new. Well, we learned something new this week, <clears throat> that Eastern Kentucky cannot handle 12 inches of rain. Um, a few weeks ago, I talked a little bit about, I actually gave a little personal testimony about my dad and being born in Eastern Kentucky. If you hear on the news, you hear about Perry County. You hear about Breathitt County being pretty much destroyed. Again, those are the areas that my family is from. I got to speak a little bit with my cousin. She's a dentist down there, and my family, I still have lots of family there, and got to talk to her a little bit about the, tr the trouble that they're going through. I'm 56 years old, soon to be 57. My uncle's house is up on, is in one of these hollers that you would think about and hear about. There's a creek. In 56 years, I've never, he's never ever had that creek rise to his doorstep. The creek came into his house. 12 inches of rain, eastern Kentucky cannot handle it. We have an opportunity to make a difference. Pray for these people, please. That is the first thing that you get the opportunity to do. If you have not done so, please take a minute say a prayer for our brothers and our sisters that are in this in a terrible place right now we have an opportunity to as pastor susan opened our service talk about week of compassion you, you hear people about giving to different places for relief or whatever 100 percent of everything that you give to week of compassion goes to wherever they're serving so they will be active with the people in Eastern Kentucky, but they'll be active with people all over the world. That is what our church does. Now, if you're visiting with us today, first time visitor, make sure that you fill out the communication card. That is your gift to us today. Don't worry about anything else. But if you're here with us on a regular basis, I just wanted to point out a couple of things as I was looking today for our giving. On the page to give, we have so many different places to give. Christians for Critters, Disciples Outreach, Discover Zone, Feeding the Multitude, Shower Ministry, Hearts and Hands, the Memorial Fund. 
renew, restore, revive. And we currently have going on our school supply drive. Okay, our school supply drive, which provides supplies to the, oh, gosh, how many schools in Boone County are we working with? 26. Oh my goodness, 26 schools. Gosh, when I worked in Boone County 20 years ago, we were only at 19. So it's grown, continues to grow. And then the final thing on that giving page on our screen is the week of compassion. So you get an opportunity to give. The first thing again is prayer. Give that prayer because that is going to be needed. Second opportunity that we have is to give back some of that the Lord has given to us. So if you feel yourself led in that way, make sure you give to that. But the other thing is you get an opportunity to give yourself to each and every one of these ministries. And that is important. Again, one of the things that I saw is, yeah, we're, you know, talking with the people, my cousin and reading some of the things is, yes, they're going to need money to help rebuild and supply, but they're also going to need prayer and a lot of help of cleaning. So my message to you today is take this opportunity to make a difference in the world. Thank you. Amen. Amen. And with that, though, we're going to have you stand as we join in singing our way out this morning. As always, we end with a benediction that the worship is over, but the, the service begins. Listen, when we talk about worship, we think about being here in a sanctuary. But worship happens outside those doors. When you answer the call to help those in need, to be a part of something so much greater than yourself. So when you sing this song about being made to worship, it's not just about being in this sanctuary. It's about being in God's world out there serving with his love. Here we go. You and I are made to worship. You and I are called. Just to believe.